Okay, uh, Tony Garnier, 1869-1948, born on the 13th of August. Happy birthday, Tony Garnier. Uh, and uh, so Tony Garnier, as you see, born August 13th in Lyon uh, and uh, died in 1948, was a noted architect and city planner. He was most active in his hometown of Lyon. Garnier is con considered the forerunner of 20th century French architects. Not a little thing. So again, Garnier is considered the forerunner or almost the father of, uh, of uh, 20th century French uh, architects. After learning painting and drafting at the Ecole Technique de la Martiniere in Lyon, Garnier studied architecture at the Ecole Nationale des Beaux-Arts de Lyon and the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris. In, 19, in 1899, he won the Prix de Rome for a design of a national bank. The prize enabled him to reside at the Villa Medici in Rome for four years until 1904. During his stay in Rome, he began working on the project of an industrial city that became his main contribution to town planning. In 1901, after extensive study of sociological and architectural problems, he began to formulate an elaborate solution to the perceived issues concerning urban design. His basic idea included the separation of spaces by function through zoning into several categories, industrial, civic, residential, health-related, and entertainment. Garnier's drawing for an ideal industrial city called Une Cité Industrielle were initially exhibited in 1904, but only published later in 1918. Une Cité Industrielle was designed as an utopian form of living for 35,000 inhabitants. It was located between a mountain and a river to facilitate access to hydroelectric power. This plan was highly influenced by the writings of Emile Zola, in particular his socialist utopian novel, Travail, from 1901. The plan allowed schools and vocational type schools to be near the industries they were related to so that people could, could be more easily educated. There were no churches or law enforcement buildings in hope that man could rule himself. The idea of functional separation was later taken up by the members of Siam and would ultimately influence the design of cities like Brasilia. Kyo was the man uh, and uh, a dreamer in a way, no? Uh, because he thought of, uh, of a better society, a better life. So Tony Garnier. Uh, here is a small, uh, you know, uh, biographical note. We already read about uh, about him. So there is also, uh, of course, Charles Garnier, who did the opera in Paris, a different architect. But this one is Tony Garnier. The Cité Industrielle project for an ideal city from 1904, for which he worked several years. Very nice drawings. Uh, you know, I mean, these drawings even today would look just fine, to say the least. And of course, done manually. Nobody asked him to do this. He did it because he wanted to be an agent of transformation of society, life, and perhaps even himself. And this, this is what I'm saying all the time to students and other people. The architect is not just the slave of the market. It's not just someone who performs a little duty for money. It's not only a mercenary. It's someone who wants to transform society and life and himself or herself and has the vision, should have the vision to do so. All important architects had such idealistic um, concerns. Almost all of them, as far as I know, Kant did, Mies did, Wright did, Le Corbusier did, they all did. Here is Garnier uh, making plans for an ideal city that nobody asked him to do. 
But these are important contributions, not just to architecture, but to life itself, to culture, to society. Etude pour la, pour la construction des villes, a study for the construction of cities. Tony Garnier. And he, you know, like any ideal city has its problems. It's not, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a desideratum to arrive at what we call the ideal, but, uh, you know, you are conditioned. Everybody is conditioned by the time and space he or she lives in. Anyway, I, I find such an attempt a noble one. But in order to do something like this, you need a visionary architect. Without that, something like this will not come into being. Many people complain, well, you know, I have no time for something like this. It's almost like saying I have no time to breathe or to live. Le rêve d'une ville idéale, but you see uh, the word ville, which means orash, uh, city, uh, who wrote this uh, place between parentheses, the, the double L, and then ville becomes V. Indeed, it's, it's the dream, it's the dream both of a city and the life, a new life, a different life. But excellent drawings. Uh, uh, he obviously showed his his uh, aptitudes for uh, being an architect. But he also built, and we are going to see uh, uh, some of his buildings. Now, this is a building from you know between 1905 and uh, 1924, the slaughterhouse and stockyard, later named after him, Hal Tony Garnier in Lyon. It's a large, um, you know, it's a large building. So you can imagine, bo uh, built between 1905 and 1924, almost 20 years. And now it is used for congresses and, uh, you know, uh, concerts and so on. Really a, a large building. This is how it looks like now, but it was built 100 years ago. Bravo to Tony Garnier. So he was not just a dreamer, but he was also a doer, a maker of things, a maker of buildings. This building is like this today, used today. Now, uh, a hospital also in Lyon from 1910 to 1927. Here yeah, it's not very clear exactly what, I have some pictures, but um, I, I imagine that all these buildings were built by him. It's still a, a moderate modernism, of course. He was not a radical uh, architect, uh, but he was also, you know, had a certain age when he built this. So you can see, you can see, uh, you can still see traces of some kind of a classicist uh, uh, mentality. But the idea of a more humane hospital with small buildings, smaller buildings dispersed. I think it's a good idea instead of a crushingly huge monolithic building. And with a lot, lots of balconies, this is also interesting. Most hospitals don't even think of having balconies. 
Now Villa Tony Garnier is his own, uh, you know, his own building in Saint Rombert in Lyon, 1911. I imagine it had some uh, modifications in time. Rather, rather austere. Now, uh, stadium, Stade de Guerlain Municipal Stadium in Lyon, 1914-1918. This one also had some uh, some uh, modifications, but even in this picture, it looks impressive. Uh, I don't know if he did that roofing or not. It is possible, although it looks rather, you know, contemporary or, or modern especially if compared with this um, arcade. The Quartier des Etats-Unis housing uh, in uh, Lyon, 1919, 1935. So blocks of flats, but they do have some dignity, uh, maybe more than most uh, blocks of flats of the present. And like we saw in his studies for La Cité Ideal, uh, we see these interstitial spaces, the, I mean, the, the spaces in between the buildings with green. And I, I, think, I think he shows his qualities of an urbanist. Now, Villa Gros in Saint-Didier, 1921, uh, kind of, you know, you, if we saw already a few buildings by him, this indeed looks like a building by, uh, uh, by Tony Garnier. La Centrale Telefonique, it's a, you know, a, for the telephone company, uh, I guess the headquarters, this looks quite modern actually, and even contemporary. If you make such a building today, it would be just fine. Maybe more than just fine. Anyway, Tony Garnier, the, the forerunner of uh, 20th century uh, French architecture. But he already, you know, he was already active in 1934, the town hall in, in Boulogne, Briancourt. Uh, he worked with us, another architect. Uh, this is the building and uh, it looks impressive actually. 1934. I have some images from the inside too. Uh, I would say it's not bad. Uh, you know, imagine that these uh, exterior uh, balcon interior balconies or exterior corridors you know, flooded with people, well, not that during the pandemic perhaps, but it, it does give a sense of a public life, communal life, this core of the building, maybe more than the exterior of the building. Look, like here, it is animated by life. Tony Garnier. Okay, and now we go to the second architect we'll talk about today, this time a man from uh, Great Britain and quite an interesting architect. An architect who uh, became a sir, in other words, he, was, he, re he received uh, uh, you know, the Nobel uh, the acknowledgements for his uh, accomplishments in architecture. But he was actually born in India. Uh, but what distinguishes him from many architects is his ability, at least in some buildings, to marry what we call tradition with what we call um, uh, modernity. So Sir Basil Spence, born on the 13th of August, 
1907 and died in 1976. A preeminent figure in the modern movement, Sir Basil Spence, 1907-1976, is best known for his spectacular design for Coventry Cathedral. He was born in India, but was sent back to Edinburgh at the age of 12 to attend school. Spence studied both at the Edinburgh College of Art and the Bartlett School of Architecture. Early in his career, he worked for Sir Edwin Lutyens, who provided him with, he, with much inspiration. Edwin Lutyens, a great architect himself, and of course, we'll honor him on his birthday and the day when he died. Although he completed three houses in Scotland during the interwar period, Spence, Spence's career flourished post-war. Stylistically, many of his buildings blend modernist and traditional elements. For example, the Regency style is in evidence at the house he designed in Stirlingshire and the Scottish vernacular at the Canongate development in Edinburgh. Sir Basil Spence was president of the Reba from 1958 to 1960. This was the man. Uh, and uh, here he is again. You'll see the beautiful, beautiful work he did for that cathedral that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, truly a, a, a remarkable work. Sussex University. Um, Indeed, his work is able to negotiate between the past and the present, between what we call tradition and what, you, what we call innovation or modernity, if you want. You can see it's not, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in a way a soft modernity, although some of his works are considered to be brutalist. Sir Basil Spence. He blends, you know, he, he works, he works with concrete, he works with brick, uh, it's, it's not dogmatic. And there is a sense of measure, a sense of uh, equilibrium, of balance in his work. He's not idiosyncratic, he's not, um, you know, pushing the limits too far, no. So this is the university, an university he built. Um, and uh, I think even today, these buildings do their job. A crematorium in Edinburgh. You see, this work uh, truly shows uh, skill and, and sensitivity. It's um, it's 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 modern, but it's not uh, alarmingly so. It has something almost Scandinavian about it. Uh, Sir Basil Spence. I like this building. You see the treatment of the windows. They are not just left, you know, uh, there is a study of the windows and they are musical. The British Embassy in Rome, an important building. And it's not far away, in fact, it's across the street from, uh, uh, from um, a work by Michelangelo, Porta Pia.
obviously he was a very accomplished architect if he was he arrived at building the British embassy in, in Italy, in Rome. It's not easy to do a, an embassy which, uh, you know, which is not stiff because it's a governmental building, you know, it's a, you know, it's a bureaucratic building in a way, but this building has dignity and yet it's not uh, irritating those with uh, more uh, calm uh, appraisals of society and uh, the role of authority and so on. I, I would say it's one of the better embassies I, I have seen uh, being designed by, uh, by anyone. It expresses authority, but on, not in a crushing way. Sir Basil Spence in it in, in Rome. I regret, I don't know if I have here uh, an image with the work of Michelangelo, which is right across the street, but I will do it for the next presentation on him. Uh, also, the building is because it's elevated from the earth, it has a courtyard. It's, it, 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 it communicates with the exterior. It's not, it's not uh, like a opaque uh, uh, misanthropic fortress. I mean, it has a level of uh, ma massivity, but uh, uh, you know, uh, th there are openings. You, you, you can enter into this building, you can explore it, you can move around. Now the beehive in Wellington, New Zealand, uh, this is an initial sketch. Uh, another governmental building in, uh, in, uh, in New Zealand, it's the parliament here actually. And uh, look, it's, it's it, you know, it, it's, it's a creative work. You might like it, you might like it less, but you cannot uh, deny its inventiveness. Again, dealing with authority in creative terms. Of course, he designed only this building, not this one and not this one. Sir Basil Spence. It's central, it's round, uh, it's strong, but it's not crushingly so, and this is important it still expresses a certain level of openness and transparency. Now some housing by Sir Basil Spence. Again, these are not bad, you know, with, uh, with the stone and um, concrete. In a difficult context uh, in Edinburgh, uh, Canon Gate Housing Development, 1969, a three block housing development in one of the most ancient areas of Edinburgh, the segments clad in rough stone and the, and the modern raw concrete elements emerge to a unity. Now, yes, there are touches of brutalism, but I think they are refreshing because they are, you know, honest in a way uh, and life is, um, sometimes brutal so uh, and but they have force and uh, they are just additions to some existing fragments of, of buildings and i think he did a good job
his own house in Beaulieu. Even his house has a, it's, it's a blend between, uh, you know, uh, innovation, almost audacious, and uh, some parts which are more calmly, uh, you know, uh, almost traditional. Interesting, uh, interesting building and difficult to do such an architecture exactly because it is uh, uh, the crossroads of two attitudes, one forward and one they're almost nostalgic, perhaps. It's, it's, a, it's a soft modernity and, and, and I like it for it. A more gentle modernity, although, you know, his work was considered to be brutalist in some respects, but brutalism is not uh, in appearance could be brutal sometimes, but the, uh, the psychology behind it is not necessarily brutal at all. But this house, I think, negotiates properly between uh, the landscape between its, uh, and its own reality as a man-made, uh, uh, you know, construction. It, it has a level of gentleness, I would say. I guess it received some uh, renovations, renovation and addition of a new bedroom wing to serve as suspense weekend retreat. This was um, just a weekend retreat, quite a you know, uh, quite a weekend re retreat, if you ask me. Anyway, Southern Motors Garage in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, this is uh, well, I would say it's fine. You know, it, it has dignity, which you wouldn't expect necessarily from a mere garage. Uh, and uh, that's what an architect does, you know, uh, brings even the most utilitarian structure to dignity or dignity to the most utilitarian structure. And nothing may be exceptional, okay, but uh, it, it shows skill even here. Soon will arrive at the truly remarkable work and is the cathedral that uh, I already read about. His rend rendering has something makes me think a little bit of um, Toulouse-Lautrec. Uh, it shows skill even, I mean, these are manual drawings. And you know, he, he made this very nice drawing, I would say of a, you know, a, a garage. Why not? But it's drawn very well. The Celters Hall in London. This is a more modern building, uh, white and everything. It's but but it's still uh, the same. The trademark of Sir Basil Stans, which is uh, a gentle form of modernism. It's, it's not crushing. It's not. It's it's negotiating with society and the individual in in more uh, kind ways. And I like the fact that I guess it was his de decision to leave that uh, ruined uh, ancient wall. That, you know, I think I think this also shows a sensitivity towards uh, time, towards uh, the passage of time, towards what happened in the past, and this blend between the past and the present. I think is a positive one. To accommodate, to say you know, only connect, let's connect. 
And now we arrive at his masterpiece. It is indeed a, a beautiful work, uh, the Coventry Cathedral, where he added new elements. Uh, so it, it's, this is not easy at all, you know, to handle the situation of an existing cathedral and to add some new elements to it, which are not just, uh, you know, details, so to speak. You'll see it's a new intervention, very creative, but at the same time, very considerate to, towards uh, what it was there already. The location, United Kingdom, Coventry, designer, Sir Basil Spence, structure, over Aru. I just told you about Bruce Danzinger, who uh, worked for many years for Ove Arup. The project is from 1956. Ove Arup also has a, a large uh, body of uh, workers in the United States. Uh, it's called Ove Arup America. And this is, this, is, this is the contribution by Sir Basil Spence these are parts of the old cathedral. And I think the, the blending, the meeting between, between the two is exceptional. And this is not easy to do at all. He didn't mimic, he didn't just copy, you know, he didn't try to, 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 to mimic what was already built. He was asserting himself, he was asserting the present and yet continuously with, uh, with uh, respect and affection towards uh, what uh, preceded him like this. This is the, the old. Even here, this is the old, but this is the new. And, you know, this, this, this marriage between what he did and what it was, it's, uh, it's um, in my opinion, is one of the best interventions in, a, in an old context of this kind, a uh, sacred building that I know of. He also had contributions for a, with a great painter, Sutherland, who did this uh, large uh, work here. Uh, and, uh, but we'll look more at this building because I, I like it very much. Look at these columns. You know, they become very slender. They, they start very slender and then become wider thicker at the top. <clears throat> so it, it is, a, it is a, the, 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 the Gothic theme, but in a modern language. It's very elegant, uh, it's reticent, it's yet inspiring and it shows what the cathedral is supposed to show. Uh, this is a modern artwork, but also with respect for, uh, without uh, trying to shock or anything, it's a, it's a respectful work and yet assertive of, of its own time. I mean, really the, these columns are splendid, you know, uh, slender and, uh, you know, elegant and uh, also having the section uh, very, starting very small and then slowly become wider towards the top and then the, uh, the, the you know, the, the arches that, that approximate uh, uh, forest of columns that uh, Hölderlin talked about. It's a good work. It's a good work by Sir, Sir Basil uh, Spence. And uh, no wonder it is praised. And look at the, look what is happening here. I mean, these are very interesting things and, uh, and you know, sophistication. I, I don't even understand very well what is happening here. Uh, So this is the, the cathedral in Coventry in Great Britain designed by Sir Basil Spence. And he, he tried to negotiate between the existing building and the needs of the new. Um, he collaborated, I read very well with the, with the, with the fine art, with the artists, you know, that he didn't do this artwork but, but he coordinated the, 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 you know, the collaboration between uh, the architects and, uh, and uh, the artists. And it's a work which is uh, 
sensitive. It's, it's a work which is modern, but it is also that modernity is filtered through uh, through the respect I just mentioned for the past. I think it is an excellent work, very inspiring, quietly, without words, is communicating what is supposed to communicate. And that is that this is the house of God. This is a cathedral. A cathedral which doesn't say no to modern art. And it shouldn't say no to modern art because as uh, Maria Aldrich wrote on the facade of the secessionist building in Vienna, to each time it's art and to art it's freedom. Something that some people don't understand, unfortunately. And I'm referring to, you know what, here in Bucharest. Uh, even the chairs, you know, they are, uh, yes, they are chairs, easily recognizable as chairs. They are made of wood, they are functional. And they are probably even moderately uh, comfortable, but they have a certain uh, gentle austerity, which is appropriate for a church. Everything is designed. I mean, there was an architect here, obviously, and everything is designed, but not in a, a, a again, in a, in, a, in a fanatical way. Uh, there is this sense of measure, of balance, which we already saw in the previous works by him. Now, even here, you know, this it may, almost makes you think of the, you know, the, the, crown of Christ, you know, but uh, transformed ornamentally and uh, in an abstract way. It, it, there are gentle references to, and, uh, to, to the iconography of, of, of Christianity. Or maybe the, you know, the handrail of the stair is a little bit conventional. I, I would say it is, but uh, all in all, and then here, Graham Sutherland, the great uh, British painter, you know, and this is, this is what the architect should do. And this is what the church should do, should bring together architects and artists, the best that the country has, and let them be free, allow them to, to respect their creativity and express it. And this is something that is not understood in our country, and it breaks my heart. Coventry Cathedral, Great Britain, Sir Basil, uh, Basil uh, Spence, and in this case, the, the artist, a very important uh, painter, Graham Sutherland, who, who uh, uh, painted, uh, you can check on the internet, some, some very, very moving uh, crucifixions, Graham Sutherland. I truly believe that the best way of honoring God is being creative. If you are not creative, you are not honoring the creation. It's as simple as this. Here you see an effort towards creativity at all levels, architectural, artistic, But in, not in an outrageous way. There were churches and cathedrals built in a more audacious way. This is still a, a work which is uh, uh, kind of halfway between what is to, expect, to be expected and, and the unexpected. But there is a lot of creativity here, even on this glasswork, you know, it's 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 uh, it's a lot of study and a lot of uh, a lot has been accomplished here. There is a lot to discover in this building, and the main role, of course, belonged to the architect, to Sir Basil Spence, who was born today, August thirteenth.
you know, I look at these images and I, I, I love Gothic architecture. I love the, the Middle Ages. I love buildings that, that do not ignore the mystery of creation. And I see here, you know, this was built uh, 70 years ago or so. And with the means of the 1950s, not with the means of uh, 1850s or whatever, you know, with the means of the 1950s, but it touches my heart in the, in, in, in the 21st century. It's brickwork, uh, very, very well, uh, very well done. And then look at the artworks, you know, just at, like uh, at Sagrada Familia, where they didn't try to mimic uh, the art uh, of, at the beginning of the 20th century, but they are expressing the time when they are building it now, you know, in, at the beginning, of the 21st century. Here, we also see uh, an art which could have been probably uh, accepted even uh, in the Middle Ages, but it's actually a modern work. And it's supposed to be a modern work because 1950s, you know, belong to the 20th, 20th century. This is moving and it exasperates me that the church in our country doesn't understand that we are betraying actually God, but by not being creative. Here there is creativity. You know, you look at, uh, at, at just at this part of the building and uh, you can tell it's, it's, it's a sensitive man who tried to honor the task he had to work for in a, in a, in a rich and, and respectful, uh, but a rich creative way. And he did his job. It's a symphonic work. That's what it is. It's gentle and also assertive. And here is the past, and here is the present, and here is the present, and they collaborate. They, they shake hands. They work together because it's the same program, it's the same cathedral. No, he did an excellent job here, Sir Basil Spence. I don't know what this is. Is it his grave? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. I uh, didn't make a note, but um, all in all, I think just for this work, Sir Basil Spence deserves to be to receive that SIR. That is the noble title that uh, some architects in Great Britain receive. Sir Richard Rogers, Sir Norman Foster, even a dame received it, and that is a hahadid, of course. Bravo to Great Britain that they acknowledge important achievements in architecture. Thank you, and happy birthday, basis Spence. <laughs>